right. Got some yups and one woo. I appreciate that. I really do. I need that. It's the energy I need in the morning. On Sundays, I don't drink coffee. I just, I just receive all the energy you guys got, and it fills me up. So I appreciate it. Yeah, it's good to be here. Hey, if I haven't met you, my name's John. I'm the lead pastor here at Community. And uh, man, I love, I love doing church together. I love uh, the Monday through Saturday. I love all of it. Our small group is amazing. Um, but I love being with you guys together on Sunday mornings too. So uh, if this is your first time or you you're, haven't been in a while, we're in the middle of a series called Uncomfortable, Navigating Through the Messy Toward the Miraculous. And uh, it's been a good time. I think I've made many of us as un uncomfortable as I can so far. Uh, but it's been great talking about how God, God's highest priority for our lives is not our comfort. And just because things are uncomfortable doesn't mean it's not from God. In fact, it might just be the thing, is try the, the thing that God's trying to do in your life. And today is no different. Today we're going to dive into uh, what do we do when we feel betrayed mistreated and left out betrayed mistreated and left out has anybody ever felt betrayed mistreated or left out yeah half of us uh, are lying and it's okay it's a, this is a safe place none of you are willing to be honest with ryan earlier but slowly i'll, I'll get you there it's okay uh, but we're just going to we're going to dive right in. Uh, if you have your Bible, you can open it up to Genesis 37. I'd encourage you bring your Bible on Sundays. Uh, man, there's some it's just good. You know, like when you read the Bible, hopefully you're doing that more and more in your daily life. Uh, when we open it up, you get to you get familiar with. Oh, that's where that is. So when you, you know, go back later, later this week, you know, where it's at. We have uh, some free Bibles back in the back for you, um, which is would love for you to grab one. So Genesis 37. We're going to pick up, this is a, an amazing story. It's 14 chapters long, and uh, Bob already made the joke about reading too many things, so I'm not going to do that. We're not going to read all 14 chapters. <laughs> but when I was in eighth grade, my mom, I grew up in the church. My dad was a pastor, and my mom was a, a, an amazing you know, woman, full of faith, and she was always encouraging us to read our Bibles. But when I was in eighth grade, I was like, Mom, I have Xbox to play, I have like music to play, uh, I'm skateboarding, like I don't have time for that, you know? But there was one time where she successfully convinced me to go read my Bible, and, and I was kind of thinking, just like, all right, let's just get this over with, appease my mom, you know? And I somehow stumbled onto the story we're about to read, and I felt like I blinked. And then 14 chapters later, like an hour goes by, and I'm like, wow, that was amazing. Like, how have I been here for an hour just reading this story, you know? So, so that's the story we're digging into about a guy named Joseph in Genesis 37. And we're going to kind of skim some of the highlights from this saga, this 14-chapter saga of his life, to see what we can learn about what to do when we feel betrayed, mistreated, and left out. Genesis 37 picks up, Jacob... Now, Jacob is Abraham's grandson. So Abraham's the guy uh, God picked out to start this nation that would bring healing to the world through his family. Now, let's see what that family, how they're bringing healing to the nations in this scenario right here. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children. Off to a really great start. <laughs> really bringing healing to the nations. <laughs> Because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. Joseph hadn't even done anything. Like, it's not like he won the Olympics or something. It's just he was born in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. Most translations say a robe of many colors, right? This is the thing that the detail most of us are familiar with. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. Very healthy family dynamic going on here. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Now, he has these dreams. I'm just going to sum it up for you. He has these dreams essentially where his family and kind of the rest of the world bow down to him. So you imagine, you know, and he's like, hey, guys, I had this wonderful dream. You all, I'm sure, want to hear about it. You know, they're like... Yeah, you're the worst, Joseph. Like, first, our dad loves you more than us. He buys you a really cool robe. 
now you're, we're all bowing down to you like you're the worst, you know? So I have some, some compassion, you know, for, for his brothers. But what's interesting is the story goes on. They hate him so much, they kidnap him, and they sell him into slavery in Egypt. Now, I don't know what your family dynamic is like. You probably have a dysfunctional family. We all do. Hopefully, you haven't been sold into slavery in another country. Hopefully, if you are, praise God you're here. All right? Uh, but, you know, I just got to say, I find so much hope in this story because look how dysfunctional this family is. So dysfunctional. But as we'll see, God uses this family to change the world. And so if you're looking back at your family like, man, I have trauma. You know, my parents did this. My parents didn't do this. My, you know, siblings, whatever. Man, I hope that you find some hope that God uses even worse families than yours to do amazing things in the world. All right, and, and that's just a little bit of a taste because in one of the next couple of weeks, we're going to dig a little bit more into how can we learn from them how to deal with our own family dysfunction because you're just not uncomfortable enough yet, okay? So that's, that's where we're going in a few weeks. But let's, let's look at this. Joseph has these dreams. As you read on the story, it becomes very apparent that he, these are very clearly, these are dreams from God prophetic dreams that come true. And so he's hearing from God. He has this call of God on his life, this sense of destiny and purpose on his life. Now you would think that his family being the family of the Lord on the earth would be excited about whatever it is that God wants to do, right? You would think that, like God handpicked their grandfather, Abraham, said, I'm gonna accomplish all my purposes through you. Whatever I do, it's gonna be through you in the world, right? And so you would think that when God gives one of the members of the family a dream, hey, I'm gonna do this amazing thing, you'd think the rest of the family, be, this is what our family does. We should be very excited about this. No, they're jealous, they're, they're competitive, and they say, we hate that God wants to bless you more than us, and so they, they kidnap him and try to undercut the whole thing. And I think this is wild because it's not necessarily Joseph's fault, you know, like his dad was treating him this certain way. God gave him this dream. He, he had some immaturities if you read the story for yourself, but for the most part, it's not really his fault that this happened to him. And in many ways, I think you can draw parallels from his life to us today because the people of God today are the church, the church. And unfortunately, many times, you know, you might think about where have you been hurt in your own life, maybe in your family, maybe in friendships, middle school, everybody, right? It's painful. It's painful, except I'm sure there's like two people in here that you're like, middle school was awesome, and the rest of us hate you. It's okay. <laughs> It's not your fault, it's ours, you know, but God's working through it. But in addition to all of those other places, one unfortunate reality is that sometimes the place that we get hurt the most is in the church. It's with the other people of God with people that, that have said, hey, I love Jesus, I want to accomplish the things of God in my life, and I, and I want to be for what God's doing in your life, and how many of y'all know the person next to you isn't perfect? There's no perfect church. I know, I've, I've probably beat this joke to death, I don't need to say it again, but the reason our church isn't perfect is because you're here, right? Because there's no one perfect. I'm here, I'm imperfect, and so this church is not perfect, but the, the question is how do we work through these things together but the reality is many of us have been hurt by people in the church, maybe by someone in this church, or maybe you're here because you're running from someone who hurt you in a different church. There are real ways that we get hurt. For instance, maybe uh, you've experienced some level of spiritual abuse of some kind. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, man, one thing that drives me insane is when people manipulate the prophetic gift on people. And it's like, hey, I got a word from the Lord. And then they just start telling you all the things they're mad at you about. And it's like, really, was that from the Lord? Or is that just you like venting at me? Like, what was that? I remember one time I was in Manhattan. I was leading worship at this church. And this guy, I'd never seen him before in my life. I'm pretty sure he'd never been to our church before in his life. He just beelines it for me right after church, shakes my hand. And I'm about to say like, hi, I'm John. And he says, hey, I got a word for you, blah, 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 blah. And then just like leaves. And I was like, what the heck just happened? Like, what was that? And I kind of felt like used, like he's like 
checking his notches, you know, like getting a, a medal for that. Or something. I was like, what was that about? You know, like, man. And, uh, you know, maybe you felt like that before from other people in the church. I heard a story about a guy who uh, was, he was, in, he was in high school in a youth group in this big church. And one of the volunteers was trying to practice her prophetic gift. And just in front of everybody, she said, the Lord told me you're struggling with pornography. And in front of all his friends, and he's like, oh, thanks, appreciate that. And they're like, man, is that really how we should use that gift? That's a sensitive gift, you know? And so maybe you've felt hurt. Maybe you've experienced gossip in the church or conflict that wasn't resolved in a healthy way. Maybe you were a volunteer in a church. Hey, our church runs on volunteers. Many of you are volunteers, and we appreciate you. But many times, you can just get burnt out. Like, man, I'm getting, I'm on every single week, three times a week. No, it doesn't seem like anyone appreciates me, and you can just feel used. Maybe uh, you were in a discipleship environment that was pretty heavy-handed or authoritarian, right? Well, sometimes it's unfortunate, but people can get... Uh, you know, feeling like, hey, I am God's voice in your life. You need to live here. You need to get this job. If you want to be in this church, you have to do all these things. You need to wash my car. And, it's, you know, it can get very dysfunctional. Maybe you've experienced that before. And, you know, I think a lot of times when people say they've been hurt by the church, what they mean is they've been hurt by a person. Because most of the time when people say, hey, I've, I've been hurt by the church, they don't necessarily mean I've been hurt by the big C organization of all of God's people throughout history. They mean like one guy or a few people or maybe a pastor or, some, or a small group leader or something like that. And so I think on one level, we need to understand, hey, if you've been hurt, most likely it's not been by the church. It's been by a person, a Christian, a, a, per, a small group leader, whatever, and to say, okay, how can I work through this with this person? Now, some people, I think, have hurt by the church, and that would be in a di slightly different category where you feel hurt by maybe a point of theology that the, th the church has. And, uh, you know, some people feel like, like in sexuality would be a clear example for today. Like, hey, how come the church won't endorse, you know, me sleeping with my girlfriend? You're like, well, that is historically something the church has believed to be true for thousands of years, that sex is designed for one man and one woman within the confines of marriage. And so to comment and demand that the church, you know, affirm that, it's like, well, that doesn't make sense. That's not what the church is. And so you might feel hurt. Well, I feel hurt by that. How come the church isn't willing to affirm that? I, maybe that's not because of the church's fault. Maybe that's on, on you to get some better theology and, and understand what God's word really says, right? So, so if you've been hurt by the church, it's either in one of these two categories. You've been hurt by a person or maybe a few people or maybe something like this. And so I think this is just, it's, it's important to think through. How do we work through these things? Because Joseph, I think, is a great example. In fact, he goes on. I'm going to summarize it. He gets sold into slavery. He becomes a servant in one of the government officials' homes where he serves faithfully, full of faith, full of, he's like upbeat. And he's like, man, I'm here, I'm serving the Lord. I got sold to slavery, but man, let's see what God can do here. He gets falsely accused of raping the man's wife, thrown into prison. And man, you'd be like, this cannot get any worse. I got sold to slavery. I was trying to have a good attitude about it. And I get thrown in prison. You'd be like, God, give me a pass here right? And he just says, no, I'm going to keep serving with faith. He keeps showing up day in, day out. He's in there for years. Finally, two guys who are more government officials, kind of, they get thrown in prison, and he helps them get out of prison. And he says, hey, when you come to the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, remember me. I helped you out. What do they do? They completely forget about him. They get before Pharaoh, and he's like, hey, welcome back. Like, how did you get here? He's like, oh, just, just here, not because anybody helped me. You know, it's like totally forgotten. And so for two more years, he stays in prison, just rotting away. And I think this is fascinating. In fact, I have a, an illustration for you guys right here. You guys ready for this? Boom. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to use this mic stand. 
One hit, it's very difficult. Okay, here we go. So you have the Earth and the Moon. And the Moon orbits the Earth. You see what I'm saying? I think do we, we put a picture of the Earth up there just in case this is too small for you, right? So wherever the Earth goes, where does the Moon go? It follows it, right? Earth goes over here. Moon follows it. Earth goes over here. Moon follows it. If, if for some reason our sun disappeared and was replaced by a big black hole and the earth just started moving toward the black hole, even though the moon didn't want to go in the black hole, the moon's going in the black hole with it. You see what I'm saying? It's just wherever the earth goes, the moon goes too. Y'all follow me? Looking for some feedback here. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay. Think about Joseph's life. He's sold into slavery. He has this call of God on his life. He has this call of God on his life. He's, man, I have a purpose. I have a destiny. He's excited, right? And how many of you guys relate to that? You come into church, and you're like, man, I'm starting to understand. In fact, I know, I, a friend of ours here today just, just gave her life to Jesus this weekend. I mean, it's amazing. When you get an understanding of God's purpose on your life, anything is possible. The kingdom, I'm part of it. It's amazing. Like, the world is my oyster. There's opportunities everywhere. Until some jerk just blindsides you with a mean comment, forgets to invite you to his birthday party, you know, whatever it is, and you're like, oh, I, and you feel hurt, right? In fact, maybe you feel like, I forgot to play this clip earlier, maybe you feel like uh, one of my two friends here. Can we roll that? So you come into the church and you're like, everything is amazing. Like, I have a purpose of God on my life. And then some jerk blindsides you and you're like, good feelings gone. Right? Anybody? Come on. Am I the only one who's ever experienced that? All right. Some of y'all still aren't willing to engage with me. It's okay. It's, we'll get there. We'll get there. But think about it. Joseph, good feeling gone, sold into slavery tries. He tries to have a good attitude about it, doesn't he? S thrown in prison again. Tries to have a good attitude then, forgotten about. And when you're in that place, you really only have a few options. And the option most of us choose, all of us by default, is, is we're like this. This is our hurt. This is our pain. This is our, our injury. Someone did this to us. It's not our fault. It's not your fault. Someone hurt you. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's a kid in middle school. Whatever it is. It's not your fault. But when it injures you, by default, the way we are wired, you are now in orbit around that thing. Wherever that thing goes, it doesn't matter. You're right there with it, and your whole life is just orbiting around this hurt that you experience, this pain that you experience, the, maybe a divorce, maybe, maybe your parents got divorced, maybe you got divorced, you know, whatever it is, your, your life is just orbiting around this thing. And so rather than define yourself as the way God defines you, your life is now completely defined by this thing that your life is now orbiting around. You're a victim. Your life is, is summed up as a victim to this thing in your life. And some of you guys, you're living with this gravitational pull to this thing that happened to you 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Some of you guys, you don't even know how affected you are because you've buried it so deep, you're not even willing to think about it. Someone might ask you, hey, what's, why are you like that? You're like, it's just how I am. I have no idea. You just, you just pretend it's not real. You go on, you're living your life. You have no idea. You are orbiting this thing that is, it's pulling you away from the things of God. It's pulling you away from the things of God. So if you decide today, you're like, I want to serve God. I want to go the way of God. Well, that might be this way. You can only get so far before, boom, gravitational pull pulls you back in. Y'all follow me here today. And so, you know, you can do a few things. You can just, you can maybe accept the reality of it. 
and you wallow in your depression, just give in. I, this, you lower your expectations for your life. This is all I'll ever be. You know, this is just my life now. I'm just following this big thing around. Or a worse option, although it doesn't seem like it to you, is you don't know that this whole thing is even happening. Your eyes are closed, and you're like, I'm going to prove to my dad that I'm not going to be the same way. And you're just like, you look very successful. You don't even know you're in orbit around this thing. And I think Joseph wants to show us a better way. And I'm going to set this to the side for now, but we're going to come back to this, okay? Just keep this in mind as we keep going. I'm going to set this right here for a second, if that'll stay. There we go, okay. All right, so the story goes on. Genesis 41. Let's keep reading this story. There's one day where Joseph is in jail, and Pharaoh has this really bad dream, and he's freaking out about the dream, and it's all of a sudden that the chef, or the, uh, the, the cupbearer, who is kind of like a wine sommelier, right? He like sniffs the cork for the Pharaoh and says, oh yeah, this is a good year, you know, and he hands, that's his job. He's one of the guys who Joseph helped get out of prison. And Pharaoh's having this dream, no one can figure out what it means, and, and this, the wine sommelier is like, Ah, I forgot about this guy. And that's, that's where we pick up. It says, Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once. He's finally out of prison. He's been in there for years. He's quickly brought from the prison. After he shaved and changed his clothes, he went in and stood before Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night. No one here can tell me what it means. But I've heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. Here's Joseph. It is beyond my power to do this, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. It is beyond my power to do this, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. Now, does that sound like a guy who's just wallowing in pity and sorrow, orbiting his pain for five years, just lowering the expectations of his life and hating God because of it? No, he's like got some faith on him. He's coming fresh. He's got energy, right? It's like, have you been in prison for five years? Because you don't look like it. Like you got some faith. You have expectation on your life. And I think this is fascinating because how did Joseph go through all those things and still show up here with faith to, to see God move in this guy's situation? The answer is forgiveness. Forgiveness. And forgiveness is the main kind of solution that we're talking about today. Forgiveness is releasing someone from the debt they owe you. Forgiveness is releasing someone from the debt they owe you. Have you guys ever seen that movie, Just Friends, with Ryan Reynolds? Or he's, no, never mind, all right. Just, there's this amazing song. It's like, forgiveness is more than saying sorry. No. Has anybody heard that song? Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, you're all like, it's not a Christian movie. Am I allowed to raise my hand? It's okay. It's okay. Forgiveness is more than saying sorry. <laughs> it's releasing someone from the debt they owe you. And it's ceasing to feel resentment for wrongs and offenses. It's to pardon someone for something that they have done to you. It involves restoration of broken relationships. Now, forgiveness primarily is not just something we do to others. Primarily, it is something God does to us. Forgiveness primarily is something God does to us. You see, look at Jesus on the cross. He's being murdered unjustly as they're driving the nails in his hands, blood gushing from his wounds. What does he say? He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. How can he do something like that? How can Jesus, the Messiah who came to save the world, it is crucified by the world he came to save, say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Well, part of it is because this is the way of the kingdom. 
This is the way God operates toward us. See, the kingdom is it's upside down from the way the rest of the world operates. The rest, the rest of the world, we, we love movies like John Wick, right? Where it's like the bad guys get what's coming to them. And, you know, they kill Keanu's dog. And so he kills uh, five million people because they kill his dog. <laughs> You know, we love movies like that. It's amazing. And there's like this sense of justice, right? Like, yeah, you get what you're coming to. Well, the kingdom of God is upside down from that. The kingdom of God says, no, 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 no. When I take revenge, it actually shows that that hurt or offense has power over me and is telling me how to live my life. But forgiveness says, no, 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 that doesn't have control over me. I have control over that. I have power over that. And so God says... I release you from that debt. Why? Because I have the power to do so. And Jesus on the cross says, forgive them, they know not what they're doing. You, you think about like, if Jesus, the guy we worship, is murdered and forgives people regardless of being murdered, how should we expect not to live lives like that? Right? Jesus tells this parable in Matthew 18 where he talks about this guy. Uh, he tells his disciples they need to forgive. And Peter's like, okay, I'm willing to acknowledge that forgiveness is part of this thing. But how many times? Like, surely seven times is plenty enough to make me look like a good person. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's not nearly enough times. You don't understand what's going on. He tells this parable about this guy who owes a king 10,000 talents, which is really interesting. Talents is an amount of money that we don't use today. But 10,000 is the highest number in the Greek number system at the time, and talents was the highest form of money. So Jesus is saying, this guy owes more money than it is possible to even think about. Now, one talent was a small fortune. 10,000 talents is like a dream, you know, it's like you're Elon Musk buying Twitter. You know, it's like this insane amount of money that no one could even dream about having. And he owes this money to the king. So he goes and he begs and he cries, king, there's no way I can possibly, this is so much money. And the king says, you know what? I have compassion on you. I forgive you. Your, your debt is wiped down to zero. You don't owe me anything. And he owed, you know, the biggest fortune the world's ever seen. Well, then he immediately goes from there. He finds another servant who owes him 100 denarii. A denarii was a smaller amount of money. A denarii was one day's wage. And so 100 denarii was 100 days wages. So not a small amount of money, but when you do the math, it was 600,000 times smaller than the debt he owed the king that was forgiven. 600,000 times smaller than the debt he was forgiven. And he goes and he says, you will pay me back every last cent or I will throw you in prison. And he just like gives this guy, you know, the what for or whatever. And so the other servants, they say, wait, this doesn't make sense because you just got forgiven by, you know, this amount, 600,000 times larger than this amount. You're mad at this guy that he owes. Surely you should be forgiving this guy. And Jesus says, yeah. He should have. And he says this, if you don't forgive other people, I won't forgive you. Why? It's not you need to forgive so that God forgives you. It's because God has forgiven you such a huge, brain-staggeringly larger amount than you even think that it doesn't compare to any of the things that we get mad at each other about. See, God has forgiven us for so much. We forgive because God has forgiven us First, Matthew 6, 15 says, if you, for, if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive you. It's interesting that in the Lord's prayer, sins are called debts. That's not on accident because a sin is a debt that you owe someone. You and I have a debt to God. We owe a debt to God. In 1 John, it says we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 3, it says all are under the power of sin. No one is righteous. No one is wise. All are worthless and useless because of sin. And so we have this mountain of debt toward God that on the cross Jesus forgives us for. And here we are. Someone forgets to, you know, pay us a compliment and we're like, how dare you? I hope you rot in hell. And God is like, seriously? Like, what are we even doing here? And I don't mean to belittle. We've, some of you experienced some very painful things. Some very painful things that I can't even imagine. But still, compared to the mountain of debt that God has forgiven you for, 
it is not only unthinkable, but it is wicked that you withhold forgiveness. Do you think about that? I think sometimes as Christians, we think of forgiveness as kind of like, it's like a therapeutic thing. It's like, well, I'm in the process and it's gonna be a few years before I'm ready. And Jesus is like, okay, well, it'll be a few years before I'm ready to forgive you then. I mean, do you think about the language that we use when we say things like that? And I understand, I understand the, the therapy, you know, is a process and all that stuff, but hey, forgiveness is a choice to release the debt that someone owes you. Now, it may not get rid of all the bad feelings, you know, there are great people to talk to about that, but forgiveness is a choice. Jesus chose to lay down his life for you to forgive you. And we're gonna sit here and withhold forgiveness from other people. Our sin against God was so big, it took God himself to come down and pay it for us. And so Joseph is in this place because he forgives. And I wanna read the end of this story. It says, Pharaoh says to Joseph, he says, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. He's thrilled. Joseph interprets the whole dream. He gives him a plan. And it's like this prophetic thing from God. It's amazing. And because he's full of faith, he's able to, to live like this. And then, this is amazing. It says, then, Joseph, then Pharaoh gave Joseph a new Egyptian name, Zaphonath Paneah, which I looked it up. It means God speaks and lives. Do you think about that? Pharaoh is not a Christian. Pharaoh is not an Israelite. He's not part of the people of God. He's an outsider. But because of the way that Joseph is living, because he's a, he is a victim, he was sold in slavery, he was put in jail unjustly, he was mistreated, he was forgotten about, he was, you know, treated unjustly, he, all these things against his will. He didn't do, earn any of it. But because he lived with forgiveness, his heart was tender toward God. He released the debt that other people owed him. He's able to hear God and bring this faith solution to Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, wow, I know there is a God and he still speaks. Do you understand that forgiveness is not only a command that is wicked not to follow, but it is a sign to an unbelieving world that God is real and he still speaks. When you choose to forgive the people who hurt you, it's, and it's not saying it doesn't hurt. It's not saying that what they did was right, but it's saying I've, I, I am beholden to a higher power. God has forgiven me of so much more. It would not be right for me to hold this against you. The world sees that and says, wow, God is real and he still speaks. In the 90s, when... You know, when I was watching Nickelodeon and trading Pokemon cards, there was a, uh, trying to keep my Tamagotchi alive. <laughs> there was this missionary family in India at the same time. And they'd been there for about 20 years. The guy's name was Graham, his wife's name was Gladys. And they were in a remote area of India working among people with leprosy. And they were sharing the gospel, but they were doing medical stuff, helping people. And people were getting healed, like not just miraculously. I mean, miraculously too, but also just they had medical training and they're helping people with leprosy. And, you know, it's amazing. They're also translating the Bible into the language of this tribe that had not had a Bible before. They're at this remote village. And uh, as they start making an impact, some of the local Hindu tribesmen, start getting very jealous, and they're not a big fan of this religion that they don't know anything about. They just see it as an outsider religion. And so they get very upset, and this goes on for years to the point where the locals are, they want to do something. We, we need to put an end to this. And so one day, Graham and two of his sons, who is seven and 10 years old, they're sleeping in their Jeep because they're ministering out in this remote tribe. And on January 22nd, 1999, this militant Hindu group formed a mob, surrounded the truck, and lights it on fire, killing Graham and his two sons. The mom is still alive, and their daughter survived. They weren't there. And they're from Australia. And so you think, if you and I were in her shoes, be like, well, we gave it our best. I'm going home. Like, we served God. And this is how he repaid us. I mean, think about 
how we might react in that situation. She doesn't do that. She stayed in India for 15 more years, working with the lepers, and she wrote this letter shortly after her husband was killed. She said, I have forgiven the killers. I have no bitterness or ill feeling toward them. You see, with forgiveness comes healing. If we don't forgive, we become bitter, but when we forgive, there's no bitterness and we live our lives. Of course, I miss my husband, but one thing is for sure, we're gonna meet again in heaven. That thought gives me solace. And there's this Indian writer uh, named, I forget his name, Vishan Mangalwadi, I think is his name. And he's a Christian thinker, philosopher, and he, he writes this. He says, in 2005, the government of India honored Gladys with one of our highest civilian honors called Padma Bhushan, this award. And to appreciate that forgiveness, to realize, like, why would the government give this to someone just for forgiving someone? Well, in the wake of India's freedom from British rule in 1947 came 50 years of riots and sectarian power struggles between the Hindus, the Sikhs, the Buddhists, and the Muslims. And millions of people were killed. In fact, Gandhi himself was killed in one of these riots. Uh, millions were made homeless. And this was a cycle of violence and revenge for 50 years. And he says this, he says that Gladys's simple act of forgiveness became a national phenomenon because it broke this chain of violence and revenge. In city after city, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Buddhists, and secular leaders gathered to honor Gladys publicly as a saint to emulate. She said the government of India was simply the last in line to acknowledge that she was an ordinary woman with an extraordinary spirit possessed of a spirituality that could heal our nation. You see, when you withhold forgiveness, you think that you are holding the other person in a sort of prison. In reality, it is you that is in prison. You are this, locked in orbit around this thing. The other person, they have no idea. They're living their lives. They're not affected by this. Here you are, you're just stuck living your life in orbit. You're missing out on the things that God wants to do in your life because this is all, your life is defined around this thing. And it's when you forgive that you really can let this go. And so it's interesting, I wanna come back to this, that it's ironic that is in the story of Joseph, Joseph appears to be the one in prison. In fact, Joseph was the one that was free because he had forgiven. And when we forgive, we cut the gravitational pull of past hurts in our lives. And we become free from the things that have been done to us against our will. You're no longer tethered to this thing. You're no longer defined by this thing that happened to you in the past. You are a free person. You can advance the kingdom of God wherever that leads you. If the earth is going into a black hole, you're not pulled by that gravitational force anymore. You're going a different direction. Y'all follow me? Yes. And so it is critical that we forgive. It's interesting that Harvard did a study. They, see, they said this. They said that it's interesting. We see people who forgive. They have lower levels of depression, anxiety, and hostility. They have reduced substance abuse. They have higher self-esteem, and they have greater life satisfaction. So from a non-Christian standpoint, they're like, how do we get the power of this? And so they have all these tips. Well, maybe you can just like not think about it as much. And you're like, that's, I don't know if that's gonna help. And so in one psychology class, uh, there was this author sat in on a class and the professor presented this case study where therapeutic methods were used to help a man uncover deep hostility and anger toward his mother. And he like came to understand himself in a new way. Wow, I've, I have all this trauma, I didn't know. And the, the author raised her hand, she says, hey, well, what would you do if the man wanted help forgiving his mom? And the professor goes on and says, well, you shouldn't push your values on people. And, she's, and he says, if you guys are looking for a changed heart, you're in the wrong department. You see, psychology sees the benefits of what God commands us to do, but it can't replicate it. It can't change your heart. And there's help. I'm not saying it's, you know, don't go into that. Hey, dig into your stuff. That's powerful. But forgiveness breaks the back of the enemy that has been holding you in bondage. It frees you in your life. And I just want to close with this. In Genesis 50, years later, Joseph is reflecting on his life. 
And he, as he looks back, he tells his brothers who years ago had sold him into slavery. And he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. You know, what's interesting to me is he doesn't say that it was fine. He doesn't say, well, that's fine. I'm okay. It didn't hurt that bad. You know, slavery was kind of nice, actually. You know, you guys were so dysfunctional. I didn't have to be around you guys. <laughs> no. He says, you know what? That was messed up. You guys tried to hurt me. But you know what? I step back and I see a bigger plan here. I see that God has given me so much more. I'm a part of this bigger thing. And I can't withhold forgiveness from you because God has forgiven me of so much more. And so as we close, I wonder, I wonder what hurt you might be orbiting around today. In fact, I want to just pray together. Let's just spend 30 seconds just before the presence of God. So just close your eyes and in your heart and mind, you don't have to say this out loud, but just in your heart and mind, say, God, here I am. Would you speak to me this morning? Because I wonder what hurt has, its, has you in its gravitational pull. Maybe it's small. Maybe it's huge. Maybe it was yesterday. Maybe it was 30 years ago. Maybe it was traumatizing. Maybe it was just annoying. But it's got you. And you're, you're starting to orbit around that thing. And that thing's pulling you away from the purpose of God on your life. And so just in your own heart and mind, let's ask the Holy Spirit. God, is there any hurt from my past I have not forgiven yet? And just in your, in your spirit, ask the Lord, is there any hurt from my past that I have not forgiven? forgiven the person yet in just 10 seconds see what comes to your mind see what the Lord brings to your mind thank you Lord thank you God now, God, what do I need to do about that? What do I need to do about that? Just thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for your presence here. Thank you, Lord, that forgiveness breaks the gravitational pull of past hurts in our lives. God, help us to be people who are citizens of the upside down kingdom, that when things happen to us, we are quick to forgive, quick to break out of that gravitational pull. We're quick to release the burden of the debt we are owed. God, we take seriously. God, we don't, we don't, sweep it under the carpet. We don't say, hey, that didn't hurt. That's fine. I'm okay. I'm stronger than that. Hey, hurt is real. It's part of the human experience. And part of forgiveness is acknowledging that. And that sucked. That really hurt me. That injured me. But you know what, God? I choose to release that debt. That person no longer owes me. And I choose to walk in faith into a better future. A few weeks ago, I was praying. I was frustrated about a, a situation where I felt hurt by somebody, and I felt mistreated, and I was praying about it, and I was, honestly, I was just like, I mean, I was just pissed, if I could be honest, and I was just really angry, and, and you know, it's it just this. this. I'm preaching myself here. I felt like God was just like, hey, you got to forgive them. You got to let it, you, you not let it go, but you got to forgive and, and move with love toward this person. And I said, but God, it's not fair. Like, this is not fair. And just as I was praying, this thought came into my mind, and I really feel like it was from the Lord. I felt like God told me, fair isn't really the best measure. Love is. Fairness really isn't the best measure. Love, love is. 
Are you acting with love toward this person or not? And so that's my prayer for us today, that we can be people of love, people of this upside down kingdom. It seems backwards and it is backwards because we live in a broken, cursed world that needs something backwards from the way that it operates. I pray that you and I can be people like that, bringing that out into the world. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.